So, so there should be a, a picture of, a, of a, a giraffe doing something unspeakable with its, uh, with its nose. Do you see that? Yes. OK, good. So um, what are you missing? <laughs> we're we're, we're going to have some fun today. Um, this, this really is supposed to be fun. I, uh, I have been involved with uh, digital photography and photography for over, over 30 years, dare I say. Um, and I, I've had such a good time over, uh, and this has always been my, one of my main requirements, are we having fun? Um, so, you know, we better have some fun today. Um, having said that, I've noticed that uh, uh, over the years, as more and more of my friends and colleagues uh, uh, start picking up the digital camera and shooting, I, I realize that they're, um, they're really, kind of, they're not uh, maximizing uh, the potential of these, uh, of this fantastic uh, uh, tool that they have in their hands. And I just wanted to kind of maybe peek a little bit, peek a little interest here in, in other things that, uh, that you can do besides just push the shutter uh, release. Um, so I'm going to go over a couple things. I'll start going over some of the areas where I've found that people just uh, either don't get it or, or just have, haven't really considered doing it, and things that the camera is capable of, and uh, also what they can do later in, uh, in, with imaging software. So let's, uh, let's go ahead, and uh, I'll be running a couple windows here. I'm going to start with a, a, kind of a keynote uh, presentation, and then I'll be swi switching over to um, an application called Adobe Photoshop Lightroom to do the kind of the demo part. Um, obviously, it would be really nice if I could uh, transmit video and show you uh, some things on a camera, but uh, we're we're not able to do video very well here, uh, or at all. So we'll just we'll stick with this more static presentation. Uh, another thing is, if you're asking me questions in the uh, in the chat area, I can't see that right now. So I, I really um, it's going to be hard unless. I'll pull um, those for you. Um, if you want yeah. to stop periodically and ask for those, I'll, I'll keep an eye on them for you, so don't worry about that. If you could keep an eye on that, and then also if you see something that's really kind of a timely question to, to, to something I'm doing at that moment, yes. that would be nice, too. Uh, sure. Because this, is, this really is a, it's not just a, a monologue. I, I'd like to, uh, you know, get feedback and, uh, and uh, move accordingly based on your questions as well. Exactly. So the, the first thing, this is one of the things that, uh, that I uh, quickly found out when I picked up a digital camera was the ability that it's something you never had with a film camera, which is the ability to on the fly change the uh, ISO or the sensitivity, um, and this just has such important um, uh, uh, consequences if you if you put this into your mind and start using it. I think you're right away your shooting will improve, um, and what I mean by this is that uh, the, the sensor of a digital camera is kind of set for an optimal um, uh, sensitivity. And that will range anywhere from 100 ISO to sometimes 200 ISO. And, and that's the, the sensitivity uh, that will give you the best results, in other words, the best quality. You can actually boost the sensitivity on most of all, or most of, or all of these digital cameras so you increase the sensitivity, um, actually allowing to shoot in a lower light condition or with a faster shutter speed. And, and this will give you a chance to avoid using a, a flash, although many digital cameras have built-in flash. And flash can be very, very uh, helpful and, 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 and useful, but it also has kind of an unnatural look. So if you can avoid using a, a flash, uh, uh, with the higher ISO, uh, there's a lot of uh, things you can do. Let me switch over now to, um, to Lightroom. And here, this is the interface for, for one of my favorite programs right now. Uh, it's made by Adobe. It's called Lightroom. Uh, it's a program I've written uh, books on. I'm very familiar with it. I'm very comfortable with it. It's a program that was built uh, from the ground up for, for, with photographers in mind. Uh, so I actually, along with many other professional photographers, helped uh, Adobe develop this product. So this is a, I'm very comfortable in this environment. So there are absolutely, there are other applications out there. I don't, you know, I'm, I, I stick to, to this because I know it very well and, and I, I really like it. But certainly I, I'm not I'm trying to take away from other applications that are also very good at, 
at working with, the, with images, post-processing, if you will. So here's the, uh, the image that I just showed you that was on the, uh, on the screen. And I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to move from in Lightroom, there's different modules. I'm in the library module right now. I'm going to go over to the develop module. And I'm going to show you a little bit about this, uh, show you what I've done to this picture. I'm going to show you, uh, give you some information about it. For example, uh, if you look up here in the upper right hand corner underneath the histogram, and you're going to see um, uh, some very useful information here. And uh, right away you see that this ISO uh, is 1600. Now, the normal for this camera, this is a Nikon D3, the normal for that camera is 200. So you can see I've boosted the ISO uh, significantly. Uh, you can see here I, the lens I used was a 14 millimeter lens. Uh, it was shot at f2.8. In other words, I'm already kind of pushing the limits of, of what I can do here, because uh, that's a wide open aperture, letting in as much light as possible. And over here is the shutter speed, 1 25th of a second, which is, again, pushing the limits um, of what you can do with uh, holding the camera by hand, which I did for this shot. So here, just a little background. This is a shot driving uh, down the road uh, on a snowy night. And it's very dark. I'm going to um, show you the before and after so you can see uh, how dark it was before I did a little bit of uh, processing to it, the, the before shots on the left, the after shots on the right. Um, and so this is just one of those shots where you know, it, I can visualize what I wanted. I knew that I, to get this, uh, to, to have enough flash power, if you will, to capture uh, everything would have taken a lot of strobes, a lot of, uh, a lot of light. Uh, instead, I just parked the car to the right, got a little bit of light from the headlight of, of the car, uh, and, then, and then boosted the ISO. Because this is just something, um, I may have been shooting very, uh, maybe a half an hour before at 200 ISO. But I can then switch right over to the high ISO uh, on my camera. There's an easy way to do it. And most cameras uh, have a way to switch ISO. You just need to check the manual. And uh, boost to the ISO, is, I could have gone higher, but that, was, that gave me the edge. In other words, I, I was right where I could hold it by hand and still have enough uh, uh, so the camera shake wouldn't be apparent. So all I did over here in, um, in, in Lightroom to get the shot that you see on the right is just some simple processing. I'll, I'll go back to reset, just so you uh, see how it was originally. And in Lightroom, uh, there's many things you can do uh, to uh, move the total values around, to, uh, to change the image, if you will. Uh, I'm going to just use auto. Auto is where I always start. Uh, it in this case, it certainly didn't help. I'll, um, now, I'm moving my exposure slider. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background and discussion about the raw fo file format in a little bit. Uh, but just right now, this is a, kind of a warm up. When I'm working with a raw file, which I am here, I have a lot of room to work with uh, in terms of exposure value. I could pull a lot more out of this image uh, than if I had shot, let's say, a JPEG. Uh, because the raw data is, is just, there's so much more information there. So just by moving the, uh, the exposure, and then I, I'm walking you through really quickly the basic process that I follow. I start with auto. I move my exposure value over. And then I come down, and I tweak the, the blacks a little bit uh, just to give it a little more contrast. I could, spend lo I'll spend, I could spend a lot more time on this image and show you exactly how I got the, uh, the image you saw um, earlier. Uh, but the main point here that I want to show you is that there's a little bit of electronic noise here because I boosted the, the ISO. You can see uh, some of the noise. It's not, it's not terrible. Uh, but if I wanted to get rid of that noise completely, uh, this is uh, something that most imaging software also provides, is some kind of noise reduction. Uh, so you can come through and use the noise reduction uh, function of your software and, and get the image down where even the noise itself is not apparent. So there's not, it's not that, um, you don't lose much by boosting your ISO. Uh, of course you get some noise. Uh, here's an image here, another example, where uh, in this case, if you look over to the right, I'm shooting at 6,400 ISO. So I'm really, 
really at the limits. But I had to shoot at that speed uh, to get the uh, shutter speed. You can see over here on the right, uh, 1 640th of a second. In order to get that kind of shutter speed, uh, I shot at f3.2, which is pretty wide open. But in order to get that shutter speed, which was required to stop the action here, uh, you can see I needed to boost it all the way up to 6,400. Again, this can be uh, completely on the fly. The shot before could have been at 200 ISO, then 400, and then now 6,400, and then back down. This is something we never had when we were shooting film, for example. We would buy film with a specific ISO and then shoot the whole roll up. OK, so this picture here, this, this uh, now we're starting to get into noise or grain that's maybe a little more problematic. But so you'll be able to see the effect of the uh, noise reduction. I have to do something here first. This, uh, I'm going to do something with this white balance, see if uh, I'll get into more white balance stuff later. But I have, there we go. The white balance is a little bit better there. So then I'll come down and I'll go to my um, uh, detail um, pane. And here. Now watch what happens. When I move the luminance slider, I'm getting a lot of noise reduction. I'm also losing a little bit of the sharpness and crispness. So I've got to be careful with that slider, not to overdo it. The color slider doesn't degrade the, the sharpness, uh, but isn't always quite as effective. You have to kind of play with both the sliders. But you can see right away there uh, the difference. I'm doing a before and after. Uh, the before is on the left, and the after was just some very simple noise reduction uh, applied uh, to the right. And you know, slightly uh, a grainy looking image or a noisy image. But in this case, it doesn't detract from the overall look and feel. And I got the shot. I mean, that's the main thing. You could, I couldn't have gotten this shot unless I had been able to shoot at the higher ISO. So the camera uh, now, again, applied, uh, is able to, uh, to give me more freedom to work. I, I completely have changed my um, uh, my shooting style with digital because of because almost simply because of the ability to go to these uh, higher ISOs and and back down again when need be. <coughs> there's this is one more example. This is a shot. A tip, this is a shot that many of you will be probably faced with shooting your a race at your kid's school or something. It's, it's hard to get that kind of a shot in a low light situation uh, unless you can get the higher uh, shutter speed. And up here uh, on the right, you can see I shot this at 1 16th hundredth of a second, which is a very fast shutter speed. And then I bumped the ISO, in this case only to 500, but it's still given me a couple stops, which I needed to get the, the stop of that action and, and to capture the, 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 you know, the, the running uh, in midair, if you will. So that's the ISO. Um, here's one more shot just to show you. I could never have gotten this shot before. Uh, this is just a shot across the street in the middle of the winter. Uh, it, something was so perfect about it. Um, and I had my camera, uh, bumped it up to 1600 ISO in this case, uh, f4.5, 180th of a second. So I could, I could still handhold it uh, and still capture this moody. Uh, a winter shot with a little bit of grain, but it doesn't, or noise as we call it, but it, it, it's not bothersome. And I, and I could reduce that noise uh, further if I wanted to with uh, imaging software. So that's um, kind of in a nutshell one of the most important um, controls I think you have in your digital camera that is very underutilized. And uh, I dare say that um, you know many of you probably haven't haven't even been aware that you can do that with your camera. If you have, uh, you, you may even forget it from time to time how how easy it is and how how there's really not that big of a uh, trade-off in quality, especially if you have some good imaging software uh, that uh, you can work uh, on the image with later. So how, how are we doing? Are there any questions specifically yeah. to that? There are a couple. Um, one person is asking what file format, image file format, um, best lends itself to such high ISO image processing. And I think you said raw, right? Well, that's a very that's a that's a great question, and and it's it really does dovetail into the 
into what I want to talk about, uh, um, you know, when, when I get into the, the whole discussion of RAW. Is there anything else more specific to um, the, just the high ISO before I move into the, into the whole RAW, <laughs> the RAW question? RAW thing. Well, what Carlos was just noticing, he just made a comment, I noticed that Lightroom adds a kind of boxy pixel when you sharpen things. And I, I didn't really see what he was talking about, but... Okay, I haven't done any sharpening here. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure what a, a boxy pixel... If you over-sharpen an image, uh, regardless of what um, software you're using, you're going to get... Um, um, well, I can show you. Let's, let's, let's over-sharpen it. It's very, uh, it's, it's, um, that's one thing you, you really want to avoid if you can. And certainly with high ISO images, uh, you, you, if you do any over-sharpening with a high ISO image, uh, you're, <laughs> you're going to just get pixels. I mean, boxy or not, they're, uh, they're just, you'll see here. So I'll go ahead and I'll turn off all noise reduction. In Lightroom, you can double-click on, um, on any of these sliders of the name, and it resets it. Now up here in sharpening, if I boost my sharpening, you're going to see what I'm talking about. I mean, it's just nasty stuff. Nasty, nasty, nasty. I mean, this is what you want. I mean, unless you like that, <laughs> whoops, unless you like that effact, I mean, you can see uh, what over, over sharpening is to be avoided. And, yeah. and, and if you have any noise uh, in your image uh, and, you, and you over sharpen, you're, you're, you know, this is, you'll get a very dramatic effect, which you may or may not want. Okay. Okay, good. All right. Well, why don't we go on to RAW? Okay, so uh, the raw discussion is a discussion. We could be sitting here for a week and, and still be talking raw. So I'm going to I'm going to try to avoid that because I have some other things I want to uh, show you as well. Um, this is a few years ago. I mean, when I first started talking about raw, there, it, it was really nobody really got it. I mean, the idea that you could actually capture and use the unadulterated data from your, your generated by your digital camera sensor, that was, that was a pretty out there concept. I think more people now have at least heard the word raw and, they, and they're starting to get an idea of, of what it's about. Um, but I dare say that I, I think a lot of people are still avoiding using it. Uh, they may know it's the best way to go. They may have heard that. Uh, but, and it's true that it, you know, a year or two ago, using raw, there were consequences for using raw. You, you, uh, when you save the raw data from your camera uh, as a file, uh, the 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 files are much bigger uh, than, let's say, you if you saved a JPEG, which is your another common ob um, option. Uh, the raw file itself is, is much bigger. So, uh, a few years ago, when memory prices were so high, that was definitely a consideration. Uh, nowadays, we have you know, four gigabyte, eight gigabyte uh, cards, memory cards for cameras. Uh, so it's not you're not losing that much by shooting raw. You, you've got plenty of room on your card. Uh, the other thing is the processors now, because to process that raw data, it takes um, you know it takes some um, um, processing to process it and send it to the um, to your memory card. So those that was also a very kind of slow process, so the cameras wouldn't capture and save RAW very quickly. Uh, and that was also a limitation to RAW. Um, the other thing was, and finally, the, the software wasn't all that available for processing RAW. But now, I have to say, all of that has really changed. And, and just about uh, all the limitations to RAW, to, to saving this RAW data, um, are gone. Um, Especially, no question, if you're shooting any of the digital SLR cameras, uh, they all save, uh, uh, um, capture and save in the RAW. Uh, many of the point-and-shoot cameras now also shoot RAW, and that's that's really exciting. I have a, and we can talk about cameras later, but I have a, a little um, point-and-shoot that I absolutely love. It's the Leica Deluxe 3, and um, it it saves at RAW, and I, once I have uh, these RAW files from this camera that has a really nice Leica lens, um, I'm just, I'm so pleased to be able to work with that file rather than a JPEG. So really quickly, the RAW contains all the basic data uh, produced by your digital camera. 
uh, it's referred to as a digital negative. It's, it's like the original source. And, and a JPEG would be considered more like a print. In other words, it's a, it's a derivative from that raw data, from the digital negative. So in the old days, we would never have thrown away our, our negative. We would um, make prints and, and then go back to the negative uh, to make other prints, maybe different types of prints, different uh, uh, treatment to that. Uh, negative, but we never let go of the of the negative. So now we have that a uh, power again to hold on to the negative. And now, and as you'll see uh, in a minute here, you have control over the processing, not the Kim. So what I mean by that is when I'm over here in Lightroom, and I'm using Lightroom again. I want to explain that there's other options out there. Um, a lot of people use uh, Adobe Camera Raw for for their processing of raw images, but um, uh, the the new iPhoto uh, Apple application that comes free uh, when you have a Macintosh uh, that's that also handles raw files. So uh, the applications out there uh, there are many more applications now uh, to handle raw files. Okay, here's here's just one example of an image that if I had shot this in JPEG, I would have been I would have been very disappointed with the results. This is the, the raw file uh, as it came out of my camera. This is shot actually very close to where I am right now. It's a, uh, an old ironworks, 300-year-old ironworks. Um, and um, I was allowed in to photograph. And for the first hour or so, I was shooting away. It was very intense, as you can see. The, you know, this is open, open uh, fire, uh, molten metal. Um, so I got a little bit flustered. and. In fact, I didn't uh, notice that my white balance setting was wrong. I had set it, I don't know, I bumped it to something more. It was, maybe it was for tungsten or, but you can see the color cast here is completely, well, I hope you can see, on my screen you can see the color cast is, is, is way off. Um, and I was shooting raw. So the beauty of shooting raw is, in fact, it doesn't matter which uh, white balance setting you've set your camera to. Uh, I mean, it, it matters in some ways, but not in the ultimate, not in the end result. Because in software later, if I've been shooting raw, if I've been saving all that unprocessed data, uh, I can go back uh, in uh, software, as I can here, and I can pick a white balance setting. Now, in Lightroom, it gives you several presets. And again, this is one of the ways I, I go through my um, image editing. I'll, I'll go through uh, oftentimes either an auto or a preset. Uh, but and see if I can get what I want. And then if that doesn't work, there's always a manual way as well. So in this case here, I'm going to cycle through the different settings uh, and see if any of these other settings uh, will get uh, get me a better white balance. In this case, auto is not too bad. It's m much more neutral, uh, but it, it's not exactly what I want. Daylight really doesn't work. Uh, cloudy warms it up even more. Shade. You could see what's happening here. This is this is what would be happening if you were changing your white balance settings on your on your little point and shoot digital camera as well. This visually shows you uh, how how much difference it makes how you set your white balance. Even though most cameras have a um, an auto setting that works pretty well. Okay, so in this case here for this picture, I, I'm not satisfied with any of those presets. But in this if it was Lightroom, I'm able to come in and use a um, a tool that allows me to come in and, and actually I can tweak it and just get it exactly the way I want. Um, I take a sampling of a neutral area. That didn't work. I wasn't quite right there. I want this to be a little bit warmer. So I think I'll come over here and I'm going to move my temperature slider and get it just where I want it. A combination of using the white balance tool and the slider manually to get it right. And, and, and some of this is subjective. I'm, all, but it, it, I'm also looking objectively at the skin tones there. I'm trying to hold those. Because that, that's one thing. People can accept uh, tonal changes uh, outside of skin tones. Skin tones, when they're off, people, the eye knows it and, and reacts. So let me just, OK. I'm, I'm not going to get this perfect. But it gets me more in the ballpark. So that's one thing right away you can see with the raw file that I was able to do with a JPEG I wouldn't have been able to. Um, over here, in my, up here in my uh, histogram in the upper right-hand corner, 
Um, this is the uh, distribution of tonal values. This is a, a graphic distribution. Uh, it shows you visually uh, how all the uh, colors and or all the tones uh, are distributed over an x-y um, um, axis. And this is a very useful tool. Uh, monitors themselves are notoriously um, inaccurate. Uh, histograms are, are, are really a good way to go to see how your, um, how your image really look how it is. <laughs> in, in fact, uh, histograms are, are very objective uh, information. Um, so here, on the far right, if I hold my cursor over the little triangle there, you can see in the image area it, it turns red. What that's telling me is that area there is it, it doesn't have, um, there's no detail in that highlight area. Now, if I had been shooting JPEG, um, I, what I'm going to do next would not have had near as much effect. I'm going to use in Lightroom something called the recovery slider. And this is going through, and it's basically uh, finding a color channel that has some uh, data in it and reconstructing it across the three RGB uh, channels. So now, when I hold my cursor, um, I've, I've diminished the the overall uh, loss of detail in the highlights. Now, for this image here, where there's a huge radical difference between the shadows and the highlights, I'm happy uh, to have maintain even some detail on the edge of this fire here. Uh, to capture that much detail and, 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 and still have detail over here in my shadow areas, that's raw. That's, this is the function of shooting raw. I get much more latitude, uh, capture more in the shadows, more in the highlights. For this image here, I might move my black slider over a little bit. Now, you can see I've shoved my histogram to the left. I'm probably, yep, I'm getting some uh, clipping or loss of detail in the shadow area. But frankly, that a lot of times I, I, I shove my black slider over. Uh, I'll, I'll move my, my black point over. Uh, I don't, I, I'm not such a fanatic about having the, that perfect uh, or having the detail in that shadow area, as long as the overall effect is still is still good. So here, here's an example. This is an example of, of one thing I can do with this image uh, shoot when I, because I shot it as a RAW. Now, here's another picture that was just taken a few weeks ago down in, um, in Tanzania, in Africa. Uh, again, again, this is one of those really difficult lighting conditions uh, back when you have a backlight situation like that. Um, you can see his face is, is really dark. Um, because I've shot raw, I can. I have a lot more room to work. Now I'm going to move my exposure slider. I'm brightening up the whole image, which is still not doing what I need to to the face. But I'm going to use uh, another slider that uh, Lightroom offers called Fill Light, and Fill Light's just going to open those midtone areas. So now you can see an image that before uh, really was way too dark. Um, I can actually add a little more fill light. You have to be careful with this fill light, because if you overdo it, you're, you get like a solarization effect. So there, I can move my exposure. I can't, I couldn't do this with the JPEG. There would be no way I could hold uh, this, uh, the, um, uh, the quality that I'm getting here uh, with, the, with this raw file. So you can see raw comes in especially uh, handy when, you're, when your lighting conditions are difficult or when you have a big uh, difference between the lights and the darks. You, just can, you can get in there and get a lot more out of uh, an imperfect uh, exposure, I guess is, a, is another way to say it. All right. hey, how are we doing on that? Am I, am I keeping people on board here? Or are we <laughs> <You're doing laughs> it's great. hard not to get feedback? <laughs> You're doing great. Your your photos are. How am I doing out there? <laughs> so, and and John Weiss is very good. So I. Oh, good. Thank you, John Weiss. <laughs> there, was, there was one little question that came through, um, and I think they answered it in the chat room. But um, Robert was asking if every camera has a different RAW format, and if they do, which one's better? <coughs> yeah, technically, well, RAW is not really great, a format. By the way. But, you're great. But but. It is. It's a great question. It's um, every camera. It's true. Every camera manufacturer uh, who who um, has a raw option 
uh, that raw <laughs> file is um, it, it's not it has to be every time you open a file in, in either Lightroom or Photoshop um, camera raw or even in the iPhoto application they have to have um, uh, brought the application up to up to speed to actually handle that raw uh, file because they're all different. They're, they're, Nikon creates a, a what's called an, an a NEF, a N E F extension. Uh, Olympus is O R F, uh, Canon C R W. They all have a different extension, um, <laughs> and then Nikon within cameras has has a different uh, uh, file uh, formatting. So every uh, every time a new digital camera comes out with a with a new raw for, uh, file, uh, the um, People at Adobe, people at Apple, people at Bibble, people, uh, all the all these people that are doing raw processors, uh, running around uh, backward engineering and creating um, uh, the, the application that will now uh, reassemble that raw data. It's a little bit, yeah, it's a little crazy. Uh, that's why Adobe a few years ago announced the the, the DNG uh, format, which is an open standard. You can convert your raw file. Uh, into DNG and maintain, hold all the uh, all the data, all the raw data, and yet uh, Adobe uh, maintains that this, because it's an open standard, uh, it's something that will be supported. Uh, you won't you won't worry that someday you, you know, click on your file and it, it doesn't open. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of people that are advocating um, at least archiving some of your keepers, some of your uh, your, your your favorite images and, and and save those as both the native raw and as a DNG. Okay, excellent. And people were asking about the point and shoot that you use that has raw, and I think they answered it. The Leica Deluxe Three is that? Oh, correct? the Leica Deluxe Three is just extra, is an extraordinary. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm I'm really dated. There's a, I think there's a Deluxe Four now. Out and I'm I lust for it, but it's it's very it's actually very expensive. <laughs> I was uh, surprised at what they were charging for it, but uh, uh, and there's a the, the Panasonic um, Panasonic makes a uh, uh, basically a similar version for for much cheaper. Um, I forget what that's called though. I had that written down someplace. Um, and, and Canon also makes the I think it's the G10, which is. Um, a little bit more of a bulky camera, so it's not really a point and shoot. Uh, but e people just absolutely, absolutely love the the Canon G10. Uh, let me just see what that um, I wrote down some links here. If I, so it's the Panasonic Lumix LX2, which is comparable to the Leica DLX3. Uh, and now again, I think they've upgraded the Lumix to the LX3. Um, I say this, and there, there are several cameras out there. That uh, support the point and shoots that support the raw file, the raw format as well. Uh, but th th I'm just mentioning a couple. I mean, we could go on and on about that. But but uh, you do need to double check. Uh, point and shoots don't all save raw. And and it, it, the other thing that's really important when you buy a point and shoot uh, at, 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 and you want to save the raw is you've got to make sure you're using a fast. Um, um, memory card. And there are different speeds and, and there are different prices based on that. And let me tell you, even with this Leica, I bought a very cheap two gigabyte card and I just couldn't use it because it wrote, so the uh, raw data wrote so slowly to it. And you, know, you shoot one shot and you have to wait a long time and then finally you can shoot another. It makes a whole big difference, uh, the speed of the memory card, uh, especially with these small uh, point and shoot cameras if you're going to shoot raw. Okay, and just a question about backing up. Um, one person wants to know how, where do you back up your your photos? Do you use DVD, CD, or external hard drives? I, I on Sunday I I go to church and I pray. Uh, okay, there would have been maybe there would have been laughter to that. Um, yeah, let me just tell you, you touched the nerve. Um, <laughs> I don't think, you know, there's no perfect solution. Tell us. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no perfect solution. But you, but let me tell you what I do. Because I'm, I, I, I was joking about the church part. But, but there is a little bit of that going on. Um, let's see. So I have in front of me 
I wish you could see this, just a whole array of hard drives, uh, let's see hard drives. They range in size from, oh, what, 750 gigabytes, 500 gigabytes, one terabyte. I mean, it's just, I have, I have a lot of these. Now, in my house in San Francisco, where we are the other part of the year, I have the same drives uh, uh, backed up I mean, with the same, in other words, duplicate files of all my pictures. So if an earthquake hits in San Francisco, I have my hard drives here in Norway filled up with all my image files. Um, yeah, OK, hard drives fail. There's no, you know, what do they say? Uh, it's not a question of uh, if, it's a question of when. So, um, but the, I have tried to, to back up to DVDs and CDs and I just, I go crazy. I absolutely go crazy how slow it is. It just drives me nuts. There's, um, I, I don't think that's necessarily the right way to go. Um, and then there's all this discussion about how, you know, how, how, how the so-called archival capability of CDs um, as well. But it, I just don't find it to be a practical solution. There, there are people out there doing uh, arrays uh, that uh, are a very good way of backing up. I think the whole a movement towards like the time machine uh, Apple has done, uh, where it's automatically backed up off, you know, off on a server or offline or someplace else. That's good. Uh, but the the answer for now is 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 to have m multiple backups in in multiple locations. Um, and that's all I can say. I think it, it, we're we're still waiting for that perfect uh, solution. Um, but the good thing is, and the, if, if my negatives ever went, that was it. I mean, they were in one location, and there was uh, there was just uh, nothing that I could do to, uh, to otherwise, other than to have prints all around. But um, but um, now I can have multiple locations, and, and the hard drives, are, you know, as long as you crank them up at least once a year, they seem to be okay. I think a lot of people probably have their own opinions on this one. I think so. Well, I thought you were going to say you didn't back up. Oh, oh, come on, please. Well, you said I, you lived, I, I can't live that dangerously. That's the one thing I could never do. I mean, I, I've had so many computers go down. Uh, like I said, it's not a question of, uh, of if, it's when. And they go, and you better have backups. Yes, OK. All right, thanks. Oh. So let's um, let's just keep moving through some of the things that I think are um, um, uh, useful to know when you're shooting a digital camera. Uh, a lot of digital cameras, uh, especially the point and shoots, have a have a limited um, uh, optical range. So in order to get uh, panorama type shots or wide angle shots, uh, a lot of people just avoid it because it, their lens they, they don't get the the shot. Uh, the lens won't allow them to. But I, I just want to really make the point how um, how easy it is with software now uh, to extend the the range of your of your lens with um, uh, with stitching software. It, it's just it's phenomenally easy. And here's an example here um, where this shot I had a um, uh, I don't remember what it was, but the beauty of Lightroom is that I can look and see what I was using. Okay, it was a I see now. It was 105 millimeters. So this was, I had my macro lens on. And I was probably shooting some macro shots. And, and I was too lazy to run and get a wide angle lens for my SLR. Um, and when, the, when this beautiful cloud formation uh, went over this uh, hill, which is right across from me. I'm looking at it right now. It's a, we're on a river. It's really beautiful here. Um, so you can see what I did instead is I, I tip my camera vertically, and you can uh, either do it vertically or horizontally. Um, there's a couple things you want to do, but, but you could, I mean, if you want it perfect, you're going you're gonna to set your, um, your, ap your camera to an aperture preferred, so you hold the same aperture. But I got to tell you that in a shot like this, just shooting the auto settings, uh, it would have probably been fine as well. Uh, especially, like I said, with this new uh, stitching software that puts it all together. It does it so well. It, it, it compensates for a lot of the flaws. So this is a sequence of pictures. You can see there; these are individual shots, each one of them. And all I did to create this shot was um, in Lightroom, your, Lightroom itself doesn't have the, um, uh, the stitcher, uh, but I use a control, right click, uh, edit in, and then over here, you can see it says um, merge to panorama in Photoshop. 
So this will automatically bring this into Photoshop. Uh, and of course, if you're in Photoshop already to start with, you don't need to do this. Or, or when I say Photoshop, I'm also I very much mean Photoshop Elements. Uh, I know a lot of people uh, don't necessarily want to spend all the money for Photoshop, uh, but Photoshop Elements is just an extraordinary um, version of Photoshop with a lot less um, no, not a lot less some less features in Photoshop, but much less money. Uh, and the uh, merge capabilities are in um, elements as well. And again, I just I don't want to just sound like I'm you know o only an Adobe uh, imaging person. Um, that's my preference. But there are so many other really good applications out there that will do this as well. So I just do that, and it, it automatically will then stitch all those together and give me a shot that would have only been capable uh, you know if I had a super wide angle lens. Uh, different optical systems. So it, it's just a matter of shooting uh, sequences. Uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's pretty straightforward, and that will definitely extend the capabilities of your of your uh, digital camera. So panoramas uh, are one way. Uh, there's other ways. I'm not I'm not going to have time to be able to. Uh, Get into some of the other really cool things that you can do, where you uh, you can actually um, uh, extend your your pixel range by uh, with some software out there now that actually uh, you can create these incredibly high resolution images based on multiple shots, even though you have a, a low pixel resolution camera. Um, there's software out there that that will take care of lens uh, uh, distortion, so that's again one of those things not to not to be held or feel like you're being held back by the quality of your lens. Although of course the quality of your lens is important, but there's a lot of things you can do with software to fix uh, shots that aren't uh, necessarily perfect. So don't don't uh, you know, don't blame your lens <laughs> if you're not getting a great shot. Um, Creative white balance control. This is something that um, uh, I, I touched on a little bit with uh, the discussion of RAW. But even if you're not shooting RAW, um, you should know that the white balance, if you set it wrong, it's going to be horrible. But you can actually use the white balance settings to, to create effects that uh, uh, you may not otherwise uh, um, uh, be aware of. So let me just go back into Lightroom and show you very quickly. Because time is flying here, I can see that. Um, so that shot there is okay. I'm going to hit the G key. You Lightroom people, G key is wonderful. It takes you right to the grid mode. And once I'm in the grid mode, I should be able to find there it is. That shot. This is shot in a farm nearby. My this is my cousin's farm. Um, develop module. Let's get out of the compare mode. For now, so let's just pretend. I, mean, I <laughs> pretend that uh, this is my camera that I'm now setting my white balance for, and I've shot a picture and I've looked in the LCD in the back of the camera, and I'm not happy. It's just you know that it's too cold. It's too um, uh, the colors are, are just too um, a little bit on the on the cool or blue side. Now, really, simply one way to kind of qu uh, easily get that. Uh, that sunset or sun early morning glow, the golden light as we call it. You simply take your um, take your uh, white balance setting and go to cloudy, and look what happens. You'll see that right away. Try that on your on your camera tomorrow or today, wherever you are. Uh, just uh, try cloudy. Daylight's not going to do much. No, that's that's still a little cool. Shade's going to make it even maybe too uh, warm. Uh, but without putting a filter on my lens. Without doing anything, without this is no, there's no camera process or post processing at all. This will now warm up uh, my picture. Now I know that many of these digital cameras have uh, settings, uh, something called Vivid. I think Sony has something called Vivid that gives you a more saturated look like this. But again, this can be done on a uh, frame by frame, uh, shot by shot basis. Uh, I'm showing this in Lightroom, um, uh, but you could do it on your camera as well. <coughs> Any questions on that? I'm, gonna, I'm moving a little quickly now because I'm want to get through with some of my main points. No, there weren't any questions on that in particular, but there was a quick question about the stitching. Do you edit those yeah. individual pictures before you put them together or after? 
And That's a great question. You know, uh, so the question is, did I, back here, when I, when I stitched those pictures together, before I stitched them, uh, did I do any uh, processing to them uh, before they were stitched together, uh, or did I wait till afterwards? Um, you can see, I, I can't lie, because you can see in Lightroom, this little symbol in the lower right uh, corner of the, of the thumbnail, I don't know if it shows up for you, uh, how it shows up, but that signifies that I have done some processing uh, to, this, uh, to these images. So I did do a little bit before I threw it into the uh, stitcher. Um, and I, to be honest with you, I don't remember what I did. But, but what's beautiful about Lightroom is Lightroom has a history. Uh, so you can see over here, this is, shows me everything I've done to this image. And as I hold my cursor over, it actually shows you in real time what's happening up above in the, uh, in the little thumbnail. So I played with the exposure value. I did an auto tone. That may not have worked. Um, I got rid of some dust, uh, exposure, brightness, brightness, and vibrance. And I must have, I may have created one setting. This is something I'm pretty sure I would have done. I would have made one setting, and then I would have used Lightroom's uh, see either sync settings or paste uh, settings to apply those same settings, because I want the image to be consistent. Um, and with Lightroom, it's really easy to do that. I can apply one setting that I make on one image to all the settings. So I may have done that. I'm not saying I did, but I, most likely I did. And that would have gotten rid of the uh, sensor spot that would have been up there. You can see how um, if I open, if I go into the Develop module, and I click on this little thing, is it going to show me? Oh, I, OK, up here. Right here in the middle, I don't know if it shows very well on your screen, but right it there, does. maybe that shows. Uh, does. That little circle signifies, and I'll get rid of it so you can see. There was a big spot. I don't know if that shows up on your screen. That's a big spot. And that, that spot will occur always in that same place in all my images shot around that time. And that's called sensor dust. And there's no way of getting around it when you have a SLR, a digital a single lens reflex camera. Because every time you take off that lens, you uh, introduce the possibility of dust that sits on that sensor. Now, luckily, it's very simple just to use uh, uh, Lightroom's uh, spot removal tool. Uh, it's gone. And then the beauty of Lightroom is I can then apply that to all. I don't have to do it at every image. Uh, so this image had already been done to as, as it would have been to the other ones. So yeah, there was a little. There was a, and then later, uh, after I'm done with the, uh, with the sequence, uh, in this final picture, I may have, I, well, let me see if I did anything. Let's see. That'll show me. Well, I may, I had to go through and do a little bit of touch-up. You can see that. I played around a lot with it, but that's up to you. Okay. So, Michael, I'm just curious. Do you explain a lot about how to do this in your Lightroom book? Okay, so the, whoa, don't read my emails. Um, oh, okay. Let's see here. <laughs> Um, Lightroom 2, which I'm working with here, is written uh, up in my book, uh, Adobe Photoshop Lightroom 2 Adventure. And everything, I mean, I love this program. I, you know, I can't hide it. I just love it. And I've written a couple books on it. And, um, and it's all there, everything I'm showing you, and a lot more. Uh, and then I wrote a book uh, on RAW uh, using Camera RAW, uh, which is another great application. Um, and for those of you who have Photoshop, Camera Raw just ships with it free, so you don't have to you don't have to buy anything extra. Lightroom is around, I think it's around three hundred dollars. Um, I'm not sure. You can get different prices. Obviously, there's student discounts and stuff. But I just love Lightroom, so I've done a book on, on Lightroom, and and then I also I also I heard just a little more PR. I did a book called Shooting Digital that. Um, my wonderful publisher, O'Reilly, didn't publish, um, but um, um, it, it's published by Wiley. And that has all the shooting uh, side of things, the shooting tips that I've been talking about, and a lot, 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 lot more. Um, but uh, the two, the two O'Reilly books are the Lightroom and the, uh, and the Camera Raw books. Thanks for that question. You're welcome. Well, I can tell you love Lightroom. So I'll let you go on. But I, I also want to say people are asking about GPS. I don't know if you were prepared to. Talk oh my about gosh, that. that's yeah, that's so important. Stop! Don't. Oh, okay. If I miss right. that, I'm really gonna be bummed. But hold on. 
Let's right. uh, forget. This is a. I was going to get into a whole thing about moving stills. That's another one of my favorite subjects. But I think I'll move right to GPS because yeah, yeah, GPS. It's cool. It's cool. Okay, GPS. Um, adding GPS capability to your camera or to your images. This is one of the hottest topics. There's two really hot topics out there right now with uh, with digital photography, and I think video and the and the emergence. Uh, of, of video and, and still photography, and then GPS. Um, so I kind of I jumped on it uh, a couple months ago and bought a um, an adapter because my camera doesn't have GPS built in. So I got very excited. We were going to go. We were on our way down to Africa, and I wanted to have a uh, uh, a way to record uh, right into the uh, um, the, the um, each shot uh, the the coordinates, uh, satellite coordinates. Uh, so I could know where each shot was taken. Um, and I, I've been shown by several of my friends, um, Bruce Dale, a wonderful photographer that went with us to Tasmania uh, on the Tasmania adventure. He uh, brought along one of his, um, oh gosh, I want to say, it wasn't a Tom Tom, oh darn, what was it? It was one of the, one of the um, was it a, Har Carmen, what, what's, the, what's the competitor to the Tom Tom? Um, Carmen, Carmen, Car Garmin, a Garmin. He brought that along, and then he would he think that up. So he had that with him, uh, and he got the the clock in his camera set exactly to the garden. And then he had software that later could merge the coordinates together. And frankly, I love the results because he had all this geotagging, uh, you know, on, in his images. But he had to do all this work later. So I was a little a little frustrated by that. I love that he had that data and what he could do with it. He showed some great things he could do once he had that data in the image. But so anyway, I went out and bought something that it hooked into my camera. It's called a geometer, and it fits on the hot shoe of the camera, plugs into my camera through uh, the same plug that I plugged my uh, flash in, and it'll um, it'll um, it, it sends the data right into the excess data. So let me show you what I mean by that. So here, I'm going to use Lightroom again. I could actually use iPhoto, because iPhoto's got some wonderful geotagging uh, capabilities now. But let's just, OK, OK, actually, no, no, I'll stay with Lightroom. And then I'll, if I have time, I'll go over to iPhoto, which I, al I also think is a great program. I think iPhoto's just uh, super. All right, G key takes me out of the develop module, because it's a lot easier for me to see things. Okay, there. And now, where was that shot? So this is a shot. Let's say later, I want to know where it was taken. I'm in Lightroom. I come over here to the metadata. And this is all information that's embedded into the, into the metadata, into the file itself. And you're going to see right up down here, GPS. So in Lightroom, it's, it's reading the GPS, just like it reads all the other information from the XF data. It reads the, the, the lens I use, the date, uh, what kind of camera, all that. But now watch what happens when I click on this. I'm going to click on that little arrow. Um, it's going to bring me to Google. I've already done this, so it, it should come up pretty quickly. Uh, oh, shoot. No, it's refreshing. OK, hopefully it'll but it's going to take me exactly to where that picture was taken. And theoretically, come on now. I just set up beforehand. Well, <laughs> I can zoom in. That's, that's the tip of Norway. And you can see the little bubble with the A on it. And I'm going to zoom up. I think I can go closer. And that's showing me within a meters, if I keep going, it's showing me within a few meters where I, where I made that photograph. So even if I forgot where I took that photograph, that information now lives with the image file. I didn't have to combine the, the, the like, like Bruce did later. He had to put the, uh, the government information in with the, his file. This was just built in because I had this adapter. Now, uh, where are we at with this whole GPS thing? Well, I mentioned to you that, that iPhoto uh, iPhoto, uh, which comes with the the, the, um, uh, the Apple, the Mac, uh, whatever you buy on Macintosh, that has it built in. Uh, uh, the software itself has it, uh, the capability to read GPS as well. 
Now here's a map that comes that opens up in iPhoto. Now if I click, this is kind of the reverse way. If I click on this uh, little red dot, as I show photos, theoretically, wait, let's see here. There, it's showing me a photo that was taken right there. So this is the the kids down in. Um, down in uh, Zanzibar. It shows me exactly with this pin. So there's all kinds of things. And now with iPhoto, you can have books that are made that uh, create maps automatically that show where your pictures were taken. And if it was taken next to the Eiffel Tower, it'll know that. It'll, it'll tag that. So there's a lot of exciting things you can do with GPS. Um, and, it's and not Michael, perfect yet. Michael, yes. once, once again, what, what's the name of the, the GPS adapter you use? OK, so this is the thing. The one I bought, I ended up not using. Oh, OK. <laughs> so I have to cut to the chase here. It, it, the problem with it, it was only it was $150, which I thought was a very reasonable price. Uh, it works fine. I mean, once it worked, it worked great. The geometry, G, is there a way I can cut and paste that information? I think I have that already. Let me, I'm going to try doing something here. You can These cut are just it out of late. there and, and then just uh, minimize I'm going to try this. Yeah. Do I have to go out of sharing? No, no, no. Just uh, select just all of that. And then. I did. And then in progress. I just have to find the window where we are, right? right? Go back to Safari. I think that'll be I am. I mean, let's see. OK. I'm in Safari window. And where would it be? Join Telegraph? This one. There we go. OK, yeah, guys, let me, I'm going to paste the, Yeah, I'm going to paste this. And these are like a bunch of geotagging links that I just put together kind of quickly. Now, at the very bottom where it says Solmet, did that show up? Not yet. It's uh, you guys, You're giving 40% off on my book? Is that what I just read? <laughs> Yes, we are. It's, wow. Well, it's, it's a thank you for people who are attending this. We don't give it to everyone. But I can't get 40% off his offer, though. Surely That's really good. Can. No, I don't think we get 40 Do we get 40%? OK. I didn't think we got that much. OK. I think, get, so, I think you get a better deal than that. We can talk about oh, that later. Oh, no. OK. Um, OK, so the very bottom, I said something. This product from Solmeta. I think that's the one, the guy, I really lusted for it in Africa. This guy at a bar had something that he was using. It had a, let me tell you, it really makes a difference. My, the one I'm using is up here. It was called, uh, I think it's this one here, Geo, no, that's not it. Oh, which one was it? Well, let me read the name of it again. It was the geometer, G-E-O-M-E-T apostrophe R. Again, I don't want to knock it. But it doesn't have a battery built in. It sucked my power so fast from my camera. Um, it was just, an, I mean, I, I never saw my battery go back down so fast as when this thing was operating. So I was very, very frustrated by it. And we were in the middle of nowhere in Africa, and I just couldn't get uh, the charge into my back into my battery. So I just said, forget it. But then I ran into a guy at a bar, of course, who was using something, and I think it was the Solmeta. I think it was the Solmeta. Um, and that one had a built-in battery. It was more expensive, but I didn't care at that point, because I would have given anything to have one that worked just the way I wanted to. It also builds in, it has a um, compass, so it builds in north-south north, south information, so you can tell which direction you're pointing your camera. And I thought that was really cool. I don't know in terms of its, you know, how accurate it is, and you know, all that. I, I can't, I can't vouch for it. The, this one. The one I have seems to be fine uh, for, for accuracy. Uh, it just the battery. Just, I can't do that. I can't handle that. Um, so check out the Solmeta, and and then also, you know, the battery is not such a big deal, and, and the price is really big uh, deal. The Geometa was was fine, and I would use it again, but but not in Africa. <laughs> Try G somebody says try GeoTagger in two. Okay, cool. This is what I'm looking for. Somebody that's had some good experience with other things. All right. Good. How are we doing there? 
We're doing great. Now, you know, I think we've gone over the hour mark. And I see we've lost 20 or 30 people so far, because a lot of people have trouble. So um, I yeah, they have to go back to work, right? Yeah, they do. They do. So um, I guess we better call it a day, but people are asking if you'll come back and do this again sometime. <laughs> what? Well, Okay, this is fun. I mean, this is great. I mean, nobody interrupted me. But now I'm looking. O I'm looking over in some of these uh, chats. Yeah. What do I do now? What do I do if I want to respond to some of these people? Oh, okay. Drobo, Drobo. Oh, that's funny. I knew there'd have to be somebody talking about Drobo. Did you see how I avoided saying Drobo? Uh, that's a backup, so-called backup solution. It's very popular. A lot of people really, really like it, and I'm not knocking it. I just, I'm not, I try not to, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I try not to be too commercial. Although I certainly am that way when it comes to Lightroom, as you can yeah. probably tell. Yeah. Well, if you guys want to keep the chat file, the best way to do that is when we're about to end the presentation is just to click in it, select all, and copy and paste it into another file. WebEx will let you actually try to save that, but um, it converts it to a proprietary format that you'll never be able to open. So the best way to do it is just copy and paste. And I always do that, so if anyone needs a copy of it, you can let let me know. And um, yeah, that's I'll, great. This is, this I'll, I'll do that because this is very interesting. Some of these comments. <laughs> and thank everybody so much for everyone who did participate and everybody that did leave comments. I'm, you know, the, we're all in this together. We're all learning together, and uh, I, I learn every day from other people. And uh, boy, it's great. And, you know, send me emails if you want. Um, and I'm, I, I try to respond as much as I can to everyone. And uh, I just I love what we're doing, and I I love digital photography. And uh, it's, a, it's a great group of people that uh, that share that passion. Yeah, it's been. Yeah. It's been, it was a great. This was a lot of fun. We have to do it again. And um, cool. I was going to tell everyone, we are recording this. So I'll, as I said, I'll send everyone a link once the recording's available. And that should probably be within the next 24 hours. OK? So if you're going to copy Thank that chat you. file, if you're going to copy the okay. chat file, I'm copy it I now. Should I do that before you close it? I'm yeah, do it right quick. now, because I'm going to, uh, I've already got it. What? <laughs> no, don't turn it off. Wait, there's another thanks. OK. <laughs> Ryan, thanks. <laughs> Thank everybody. Wait, copy. Ah, hold on, don't. This is important stuff, you know. It is. Where am I? Okay. All right. Don't close me down yet. Uh, text. I just want to make sure I got it. Yeah, I throw it uh, in text edit too. <laughs> this way, I can prove to my wife I actually did something useful today. <laughs> is, that, is that all of it? Oh no, that, I think I only got the last few. Ah, hold on. You don't do it. Don't. Uh, all right. Don't close it. You know what happened? Oh, something keeps popping up. And uh, yeah, well, I even get the book, somebody says. Good idea. Good idea. OK. I'm going to get ready? the book for that price. Hey, Come on. Hey, Nicole, okay. I can give you a great Man, deal on the I'm book done. if you talk to me. What? I said, talk to me. I can get you a great deal on the book. You know, what I'm talking about here in Norway. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> OK. Yeah, that's that's the All problem. Right. I have a bunch of books waiting for me in San Francisco. No. Okay. That's All right. Thanks, everyone. I'm turning it off okay. now. Okay. Turn it off. I'm leaving the room. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>